in church family. We're almost to the point where we can see each other's faces again. Uh, so good to be with you. Yeah, good to see smiles. Would you all stand with us as we uh, begin our time of worship this morning? As we begin today, uh, I just want to go to the Lord first in prayer. So just invite you. Uh, let's just pray together. Just ask God to empower us by His Spirit as His people to be effective witnesses for Jesus. We need Him. We need to be aware of His presence. We need the power of the resurrection that He offers us through His Spirit. As we enter into prayer, we just pause just to be still for just a minute. Breathe slowly just to recenter your scattered thoughts and senses on just the presence of the Lord with us. Creator God, who formed us from dust, breathe in me again. Revive me and sanctify me by the power of your spirit. Set my heart on fire with the good news of the gospel. I choose today to rejoice in your majesty as we stand just as grateful people in your presence. We join in the ancient praise of your people, Lord, in the words of Psalm 24. The earth and everything in it the world and its inhabitants belong to you, Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Father, through the Son, and by the Spirit, as we sing.
And so as we begin this time, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and invite the Lord into that quiet space, reflecting on the week, on this day, on the state of your own heart. What are those longings, those desires, those shadow places that you haven't wanted to see, you haven't allowed um, people into, or even yourself? And just let him move. Forgive us for all the ways we turn from your beautiful life and choose our paths of death and destruction instead. We grieve the ways we have not walked in the freedom you have for us, bound up in old patterns that did not align with your kingdom. Jesus, thank you for laying down your life when we least deserved it. You offer us forgiveness from our deepest, darkest sins and reveal a better way to us that we long to follow. Holy Spirit, bring new life where we are worn and tired. Bring new love where our hearts have grown hard. Bring forgiveness where we feel hurt and where we have wounded others. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. Grant us joy and freedom where we are living as prisoners of ourselves. Amen. In Revelation 21, we have this assurance. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Hallelujah. Let's rejoice together.
hearts are just grateful, Lord, that you and your greatness approached us in love. You came to, to seek and save the lost. You served and you served and you served. You gave and you gave and you gave. So Lord, we just thank you for your generosity that you modeled for us and we long to be like you, God. For in you, we move, we live, we have our being. We exist because you exist. Lord, would you make us more like you, more like your son, Jesus. We want to long for the things that, that you're doing in our midst, Lord, that you'd give us eyes to see and hearts to understand and to empathize and be compassionate as your people. Lord, we want to steward our gifts, everything that we have, belongs to you. Lord, we want to steward them towards your kingdom that is eternal, not building up things here on earth that, that moth and rust will destroy. Oh, fade away, God. Just in our posture of worship, if you just join me in reading our prayer of generosity. And if this is your church, this, home, this is your home church, we long to be like our Father. And so we pray this every week as a asking, Lord, line our hearts up with yours. Make us like your son, Jesus. Let's read this. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given to me. All I have and all that I am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who confess Jesus as their Lord, who love him with free hearts, who serve him with renewed minds, whose hearts are rooted in your kingdom, not in the systems of this world. Holy Spirit, grow our hearts in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. Lead us to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your sons and daughters to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. Now, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see you. Would you illuminate the scripture to us this morning as we submit ourselves, Lord, to your word that is living and active. Teach us, God. church. Today our scripture reading comes from Acts 8, verse 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of, of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shear is silent. So he, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. He can, who can dis describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What, what prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord.
Well, uh, good morning. Uh, it's so good to be worshiping the Lord with you this morning. It's so good to be in his presence and to be in his word. Before we jump into the word and even before we pray, though, um, I want to just make a quick couple of announcements. Well, really just one now and then a couple will come uh, in the course of the sermon. Uh, but the we've been meeting now at... Uh, what we'll say is extremely limited capacity uh, for, for a few months now, um, capping the service at uh, 25 to 30 um, and being very spread out. For those of you who are watching at home, you don't probably have the same vantage point that we do, but there's a lot of distance and uh, we've been doing this for a while and there's there's room to add more people. There's room to add more chairs to keep safe distance as more and more people are being vaccinated, especially within our church community. Uh, we want to provide more and more opportunities for people to join us together on Sundays. And so uh, in two weeks, I believe two weeks, you'll get an email confirming it. But in two weeks, we're going to go ahead and double our registration Limit. So if, you, if you're sitting there and you know, you're know you like me and you wait till Sunday morning at like 7.30 to try and register and then you're saying, oh, full capacity again, um, first of all, the, it goes out on Tuesday. Uh, but secondly, um, we're, we're doubling capacity for you. Uh, also, parents, especially parents of small children, be on the lookout for uh, a survey talking about the reinstating, uh, the sort of slow, basically moving to that next stage that we had talked about uh, kind of slowly, but parents, as, as we think through what that means for children and especially smaller children, we want some input from you. So uh, all of these things are good. We're really excited. I, I remember when we first gathered together, seeing people masked, yes, uh, distanced, yes, but still hearing those muffled voices through the mask, singing and worshiping Jesus together. And we just want more, y'all. We want more people in here uh, while maintaining some wisdom as well. And, and so we're, we're doing that in just a couple weeks, uh, and we're letting you know that now. Uh, before we jump into the text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this story. Thank you that our brother Luke, Dr. Luke, thought this was important enough to record for Theophilus and therefore important enough for us all these years later to hear. I pray that we would uh, see the truth of who you are and who we are in it, God, and that we we would be moved, transformed, emboldened, empowered. In Jesus' name, amen. Just about every week, we remind ourselves, we remind each other that Vintage Church is a church for doubters and for seekers and for followers to learn how to worship Jesus together. And so what that means, if we're talking about doubters and seekers and followers, is that it, it forces us to be honest about where we fall within those realities. Uh, and sometimes to be honest about the fact that we're all three at once, right? We're people who are seeking after Jesus, trying to follow him, and yet doubting what's going on. And so it's not so simple as to break it into three unique categories. Uh, but this morning, we're kind of going to do that. Because we have this story that's about a follower of Jesus who, by the power of the Spirit, encounters a seeker. Someone who's trying to figure out who God is, what this is about, and, and what his spirituality, his faith is going to look like. Now, if you're a doubter, I think this story is also for you. If you doubt the love and the care of Jesus, if you doubt some of the things that we've been talking about from the beginning of our series in Acts, the fact that God designed and, and intended for his church to be a community of witnesses that was omnicultural, 
that didn't bear the specific marks of one culture over others, that wasn't uh, in, intending to disciple and change and transform people to look like one specific culture that's got it right, and to put aside all of those other cultures in order to be a part of that. Right? This story speaks to the fact that God's vision is for all the nations. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It also shows us God's love for individual people. And in some regards, this is the first such story that we're getting in the book of Acts. So far, the gospel has advanced through the apostolic teaching and the community of Christ, the Christian community, living and acting love. Love for God, love for one another, love for neighbor, love for enemy. We've seen that in all of their stories. And whether it's Peter preaching that the gospel, the, the first sermon of the church at Pentecost, whether it's Stephen asking God to forgive the very people who were stoning him to death, We've seen this love happen in these sorts of ways. And when we've seen the response to that, it's been massive numbers. Peter preaches and thousands are saved. Stephen is martyred and the gospel multiplies greatly. We've seen sort of this witness advance in, in, in this ways that is communal and corporate. And I want to remind us of that. The greatest testimony and witness to the veracity, to the truth of the risen King Jesus is his church actually in humility, loving one another, living mutually submissive lives, not lording authority and power over one another, but serving, being quick to forgive, slow to anger, abounding in love. A community where there are no needs named among us. We've been saying this because this is who we want to be. And before we start to talk about who you're supposed to be, we have to talk about who we're supposed to be. And you may know this, right? Sometimes we'll wear it as a badge of honor, but we'll have friends who will say something to the effect of, you know, I like you even though you're a Christian. Right? Like, if all Christians were like, some of you have heard this, I know it. Like, if all Christians were kind of like what you're talking about, I'd be about that. But I see the community, and, and the witness of the community is greater than the thing that you're telling me or even your individual story. And so, right from the beginning, the community of Jesus is so integral to the advance of the gospel, to the witness of the resurrected Christ. And so are you individually. It's the community and it's us individually in our lives, as families, in our, on our blocks, in our neighborhoods, wherever we go and work, the lives that we lead individually, the words that we use, right? God uses you individually. And here's what's remarkable, is that God, one of the ways God uses you individually is through the power of the Holy Spirit uniquely gifting you. We talked about this in, in Acts 1, right at the beginning, that, that Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. And we talked about Pentecost and how God fulfilled the promise that he would pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters would prophesy. Old and young would have dreams and visions. All would be uniquely gifted by the Spirit for the glory of God, for the good of all peoples, and for the love of the church of Jesus. You've been gifted. Right? And, and we're blessed by each other's gifts. Some have been gifted with music and, and the ability to lead in worship, and, and we don't thank Seth, and Crystal, TK, and all of the folks who are up here, week in and week out, just leading us to the, to the throne in worship. We don't thank them enough, because that's a spirit gift. That's a Holy Ghost gifting that they're using for the benefit of the church. 
right? And often we don't think about the people who are running AV, the folks who scan us in to make sure that we're not like 108 degrees and passed out, who welcome us, who set up chairs, who, who are there to greet us, for the people who are behind the scenes praying, using their gifts. The fact is, each and every one of you is integral to the life of Vintage Church. And you've been gifted by the Holy Spirit. That, that unique intersection of things that you're just really good at and really passionate about and using those for the church. Among those gifts is the gift of evangelism. There are some people who just have this gift where they go out and they meet people and they just can communicate the love of Jesus. Rick Warren, he's a pastor out in California, if you haven't heard of him. One time he said, and I love it, he said that evangelism is building a bridge from your heart to someone else's so that Jesus can walk across. And some people are just bridge builders. And some of us, see people, and we're like, nah, you know, that is a person. I'm sure they have thoughts. <laughs> and you, <laughs> like, you know? But listen, some of you, and this is why this is the beauty of both the corporate witness and the individual witness, is that it means that sometimes inviting people into the corporate is how you demonstrate and how you begin that process of bearing witness of who Jesus is. Nonetheless, God has gifted you uniquely, and God has placed you in different spheres and communities so that you might be a witness. And now Philip, Philip, who we're talking about today, we've heard his name before. When we were talking about deacons a couple weeks ago, Philip was one of the seven that was named. So that tells you something about Philip's Holy Ghost gift set. Philip had a heart for the needy and for justice and for making sure that none were overlooked. The way that the Holy Ghost equipped Philip to serve the church was by making Philip one of the people who stewarded the charity and the giving of the church, who shepherded the church by making sure that there were no needs named among them by anyone. Philip recognized the cultural barriers that existed and was able to, to move and navigate those in such a way that the church maintained its beauty by being a place for all peoples. That was Philip's gift. And yet, here Philip is. And he's about to bear witness to a person. Right? All of us have gifts, and all of us are called to be witnesses. And we see that in the life of Philip. And so here's what we want to do. We're going to look at just a few things in this text, and we're going to unpack what it looks like to be witnesses, what it might mean to be witnesses, and what it might mean to be those who are hearing this gospel witness and how to think and conceive of it, how to wrestle with it, and what faith looks like. We're going to do that by talking primarily about three things, two people and, and a text, right? We're going to talk about Philip. We're going to talk about this Ethiopian eunuch. And then we're going to talk about the scriptures. And then we're going to come back, hopefully, very practically to us. So you with me? We're going to talk about Philip, the eunuch, the scriptures, and us. All right, so let's look at Philip, okay? As we said, he's a deacon. He's been gifted in a unique way, but the church has been uh, persecuted and scattered. And so Philip now is one of those who's been scattered. He's doing the good work that Jesus has called him to by the power of the Spirit. And it says, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, like, this is interesting to me in some ways because we don't quite know what is meant by angel of the Lord. That word angel can mean messenger of the Lord. Right? So sometimes in the scriptures we see angels appear. Right? And they come and they're clothed in white and they're shiny and they're in the heavens and they're singing and the shepherds are like, 
angels. And we know these to be heavenly beings. And sometimes people act as angels, as messengers of the Lord, coming with thus says the Lord, listen and do as the Lord says. Sometimes the Holy Spirit acts as the messenger of the Lord, leading and guiding. Whether it's any of those three, we actually in this text don't know. I tend to think it's the Holy Spirit personally because of how it's talked about later, right? But what we do know is that Philip had a plan. Philip had a way that he was going and he received a message from the Lord to go a different route. And then it keeps going because he listens and he goes and as he goes on this route, he sees this Ethiopian eunuch. And it says in verse 29, the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Right now, this is a second interruption. Philip is going one way. The messenger, the angel of the Lord tells him to go another way. He's on the way to do what he's been told to do. And now the spirit says, hold up, go to that chariot. Now, first of all, think about how strange those instructions are. And this is a good time to remember that these are descriptive and not prescriptive, right? So, like, the Holy Spirit might be telling you to run up on that car and talk to somebody, but also maybe not. You know, like, this text isn't saying that for you. It's saying what happened there, but that's what Philip was told to do. Go to that chariot with that foreigner, that Ethiopian that eunuch, that servant of another ruler. Again, what are we seeing in all of this? Things that by the law were unclean. Things that by the law weren't allowed in the presence of God. So now we're moving in this trajectory where Philip is being told to do things that would be outside of the understanding of who Christians or who who Jews and Jesus followers were, were going to, where they were going, how they were doing ministry. The Holy Spirit called an audible. And Philip had the sensitivity to listen. When we think about Philip as an example of bearing witness, the first thing I want us to think about is that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I don't know what that looked like, what that impression was like in Philip. But we know that he understood it. He was sensitive to it. And he listened. The Holy Spirit leads. Then the next thing that we see is he's willing to do it. Now listen, I'm telling you, and and before when I was talking about some of us, I'm really talking about me. (laughs) If you don't know, like, one-to-one, like, meeting new people, which is, this is a funny job for that to be the reality, but I'm just heavily introverted and at times feel very socially awkward and don't know how to talk to people, especially, like, and so I'll, like, other people hey, you start, and then I'll come, like, slide in. Like, oh, you know him, I know him, and you know, hey, you know. But, like, if it's just, I see you, all, and I feel like my face betrays me. If you're like this, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because, like, the whole way there, you're like, say something human. Say something, <laughs> you know, and then you get there, and you're just like, uh, Battlestar Galactica is the greatest show that's ever been. And then you just kind of pass out. And, <laughs> and it, It takes Holy Spirit prompting with Holy Spirit power in order to follow what God has told him to do. So he does it. But not only is he willing to go, he's willing to engage. And so he goes and he hears and he sees that this man is wrestling with the prophet Isaiah. He, he speaks to him. They speak. He's like, I'm reading this. Do you know what this is about? And he's willing to engage him. Now, what's remarkable is Philip is not an apostle. He's a Hellenistic Jew who's been made a deacon. 
And yet, he's willing to use the knowledge that he has, however much that is, in order to engage. Right? You would think if we're going to see things like this, we're going to see the most gifted speakers doing it. We're going to see the most Holy Ghost-filled apostolic leaders doing this. But it's not Peter. It's not one of the apostles. It's a deacon. It's a servant of the church. And he's willing to engage And he has enough knowledge of the scriptures to say this is about Jesus. So here's Philip. He's sensitive to the spirit. He's willing to engage. And he is able enough to communicate Jesus. And this is what the Lord uses in the life of the Ethiopian eunuch who we need to talk about as well. This man, this Ethiopian eunuch, he's a servant in the council of the court official Candace, who was the queen of the Ethiopians at the time. So this this man has actually a position with much power and authority in his sphere and in his nation. It tells us specifically who he was. He was the treasurer. He was in charge of all of her treasure. This is really interesting as a role because it makes me think of it. It harkens back to uh, Joseph. Joseph, who was an Israelite, who found himself in Egypt, who was a devout follower of the Lord, and yet found himself the treasurer and second in command of all that, 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 uh, that Pharaoh owned and had. Right? There is this sense in which this role is really significant in the life of the scriptures. And it's interesting even more to me that he's reading Isaiah. Because in Isaiah, we get this vision of God who has a global ministry and a global mindset and a global mission. In Isaiah, we get this story where the prophet looks out and he sees something coming along the seas. And what is it? It it looks like clouds at first coming. And then as it gets closer, he realizes it's too distinct to be clouds. Maybe it's birds. He doesn't know what it is. And as it keeps coming, he realizes it's ships coming in. And what Isaiah says is it's the nations bringing their wealth to Zion. So now here we have this representative of the nations who's the treasurer, who's the one who's able to bring the wealth. And I often wonder, as this Ethiopian eunuch is working his way through the scrolls of Isaiah, if he sees these things that happen time and time again, and as he finds himself worshiping in Jerusalem time and time again, he realizes this connection between his unique Role and the vision that God has given. How is this to come about? How am I to be a part of this? You see, when we talk about the eunuch being a seeker, this is what I mean. When we talk about seeker like that, I get that word has been used a lot over the decades, and sometimes you hear it and you kind of like uh, bristle and bristle against it. But all it means here and all that we mean by it is someone who is seeing, who has caught a glimpse of the mystery of creation and of the wonder and, and, and the curiosity of the creator and wants to know their place in it all. And that's so much of and so many of us. I hope that's you. Even if you're a follower of Jesus, I hope that what you see is that creation is great. It is vast, expansive, amazing, and it is beyond us. And I hope that that prompts you, that awe and the mystery and the wonder to desire to be a part of something greater than just serving yourself. I hope that it causes your heart to rebel against this very Western, very modern notion that rugged individualism and material wealth satisfies. Those who seek are those who dug into that and seen them to be what they are, hollow. 
The self is not enough. Things, success as the world deems it, is not enough. There's more. You've been called to so much more. You've been created for so much more. And when you realize that, I hope and I pray that we all give our lives to finding out and to living into that for which we were created. So much more than just yourself, myself. And so he sees it, and he's caught in the mystery of this very long prophetic book. (laughs) And wouldn't you know that when Philip comes, he's engaging in this portion, in Isaiah 53. Like a sheep led, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, Justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. This is what we see about this eunuch. He's a worshiper. He's a deeply spiritual person. This is is what it tells us. He's coming from Jerusalem where he was worshiping. He'd come to Jerusalem specifically for that. He didn't go to Jerusalem on business and was like, man, I'll catch a service while I'm here. Like he knew Jerusalem to be the place where worship of this God happened. And he came on purpose. Some of you are here on purpose, and I'm so glad that you are. He's engaging with the scriptures, and he has genuine questions. For those of you who are followers of Jesus who like to engage with people who are seekers, and I, again, I, wish, I want to get away from the categories, and we will. Ultimately, that's why I started with it's not so black and white and hard line. But if you're wanting to engage with people, then you're going to have to realize, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's fine, that the scriptures, that there are people who are genuinely engaging with the scriptures, And their questions aren't meant to be argumentative. Their questions aren't meant to make you look foolish. Their questions aren't because they're genuinely wrestling with the scriptures. And you ought to as well. We ought to be people who see the complexity of the scriptures and who wrestle with it and who have this humility. So if you're here and you're wrestling with the scriptures, you find this to be you, this is what he says. He says, I'm I don't understand what I'm reading. How can I if somebody doesn't guide me? Have that 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 humility and have let that desire to learn move to a place where you ask genuine questions. In the context of Vintage Church, one of the places that that can happen is at our community groups. Each week, we have groups of people that gather together. Right now, it's summer on Zoom, summer in person, but they wrestle with the scriptures together, and you'd be welcome to wrestle with them. But this man is wrestling with me. He's engaged with it, and he has questions, and so he asks, and Philip I mean, I love this because honestly, this is about as soft a softball as you can get, right? This is like batting cage level low. All right, he was led like sheep to a slaughter. He didn't shut his mouth and he was killed. Who is this? You know, and Philip's just like, you know, like this is, who, who is this? About whom, I asked, does the prophet say this? It's Jesus. And it says that Philip explains that and goes through all of this with them and shows how it's Jesus. Jesus is the one. And this eunuch responds in faith, belief, baptism. He wants to be baptized into this community of Christ. So if that's you, if you've engaged with this, and week after week you're saying, And as I just think through the things that we've talked about over the last six months that I've been here, we've talked about justice, and we've proclaimed a God who loves justice and whose heart is for the margins. 
and who sees the poor and the vulnerable and cares for them and calls his people to care for the poor and the vulnerable, who sees the afflicted and the oppressed and cares for them. Right? We even see that in this text. The eunuch sees a God of justice, one who injustice has been done to. A court official eunuch was not eunuch by choice or by birth, typically. You can look it up. (laughs) So he understands it. Look at this God of justice, or this God who meets us in our sorrows, your suffering and your mourning. And the question of the spirit in the heart is, where is God in all of this? And we've told you that this God is with you. In fact, this God has shared in your suffering through the person of Jesus Christ. We've talked about the care and the love and the presence of God in the midst of suffering. We've talked about the resurrected Christ, the one who's not dead, but it's alive and seated in glory and therefore is able not only to, to commiserate with you in your suffering, but will bring an end to all suffering. Yeah. Right? This Jesus, if you wrestled with this Jesus, you're saying, you know what? That's who I want to put my cards in. With. I believe him. See him. And I would encourage you to take that faith, that belief that is emerged in you, to be baptized. Baptism is just entry into the covenant family of God by obeying Jesus. Jesus says that all who, the scriptures tell us that all who believe are to be baptized. So if you uh, haven't been baptized and would like to be baptized, if you feel that Holy Spirit tug on you towards baptism or faith, talk to me. After the service, email me, call me, talk to me. We want to make this happen. And we're going to have times for baptism in the coming weeks. But the eunuch responds in faith. So here's the last thing we want to talk about is the scripture. Because that's the linchpin here. We've got Philip the follower who's sensitive to the spirit. We've got the eunuch who's seeking to understand, who's reading the scriptures and and needing that guidance. And they intersect and, and it says that Philip told him, opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, beginning with, he told him the good news about Jesus. And I imagine that this conversation went something like this. That sacrificial lamb who didn't open his mouth His name was Jesus, born of Mary, grew up in Nazareth. He's the son of the living God, the Messiah that you've been reading about and waiting for. All of the book of Isaiah is talking about justice that the Lord is going to bring through his coming Messiah. It's talking about a servant who will suffer on behalf of the people of God. It's talking about God gathering all the nations together. The reason that your heart has been stirred to come from Ethiopia here to Jerusalem to hear about this person has been fulfilled in Jesus. In Jesus for you. He's Lord of all. And there's a group of us who are following in his way. So you can be a part of that too. And I would express that same thing today. And I would encourage you that that is simple right there. Listen, the scriptures are not always obvious and not always clear. So often in our conversations, we we say things like, if you just look at the scripture, it's just clear in scripture. And the fact is, scripture isn't always clear. But one thing that is clear is that scripture is always, always pointing us to Jesus. The Old Testament points forward to what God is going to do through his son, Jesus. The New Testament shows us how to live in light of what God has done through his son, Jesus. And as we respond, we are Jesus' people. And the scriptures come back to him. And so as you walk in sensitivity to the spirit and find yourself willing to engage, 
the end of it all. Even when you have to say sometimes, I don't know. You do know this. That Christ died according to the scriptures. That Christ was buried. And that Christ was raised according to the scriptures for our redemption. Every one of us can bear witness to that if indeed we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, living lives of the resurrection. And this is what Philip does. And this is who we're called to be as well. It's not his everyday thing. God called him audible. This is what he does. So let's be that. Let's be a community of witnesses. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, make us sensitive to your spirit. We want to be a community of people who live in such a way that we testify to the goodness and the resurrection of Jesus as a people. But we also want to be a people who follow your spirit into life on life witness. Who are able to testify to the resurrection and the glory of Jesus. Who are able to say, Jesus is Lord and he loves you. He's with you. God, help us to be people who are honest about where we need guidance. God, help us to respond in faith and community. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week we hear the gospel and we respond in part by coming to the table. And as I think about being witnesses in Durham and wanting to be a church that grows in ethnic diversity in Durham, I think about this story actually a lot. Uh, so I, I'm going to give you just a little bit of my story. I, I grew up um, in high school. I went to a very fundamentalist school. And one of the things that I heard time and time again was that colonialism and slavery in some ways were able to be justified because that's how the gospel reached the African people. When we talk about coming to the table, we're talking about a global people eating and drinking the death and resurrection of Christ, a global community. And here's what this story reminds me. And archaeology is confirmed. The, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, that the church in Ethiopia existed before the gospel got to Western Europe. That the reason that the church is global is the faithful witness of the apostolic community, not the forces and, and the powers of conquest. That God built his church through love and mercy and justice and the proclamation of Jesus. And therefore, the church is not a Western European construct, but rather a global reality. And when we come to this table, we come with the African desert mothers and fathers who ate it before us with the Ethiopian Christians who ate it before us, with all of the global church, we come to this table. Because on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread and he said, this is my body. And the body of Christ was not broken for any other kingdom than his own. 
And in the same way, he poured out the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the remission of sins, the blood of a new covenant, making us a new global covenant community. That is a powerful witness. And we eat and drink it week after week after week. And so you should have received uh, the, the bread and the juice and, and, uh, and I use that term bread loosely. Um, but at this time, peel back that first layer and take the wafer. The body of Christ was broken for you so that you might be made whole. Now peel back that second layer and drink the fruit of the vine. And remember, the blood of Christ was shed for you. Be thankful. We also respond in prayer. And we pray for one another and we want to pray for you. And so there are connect cards in the chair in front of you. They have prayer spots. You can fill that out. If you're new, I'd invite you to just fill that out and put it in the, the giving bowl in the back. Uh, that way we can be communicating with you. And we're just so grateful that you're, you're here. Uh, but if you have prayer requests, you can share them there. You can email us. Uh, you can go onto the website. There's a prayer wall. You can do that as well. Pray for one another. And the final way we respond is in worship. That's what we're going to do now. We're going to go to the Lord and worship. The Lord who cared enough about one individual Ethiopian eunuch seeker that he sent Philip out of his way to go talk to him. And who cares that much about you. And who is saving all of his people to the uttermost.
people of God, let us live out of this freedom that Christ gives us by his sacrifice on the cross. May he empower us by his spirit to serve our city of Durham together in faith, hope, and love. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may go in peace. And if you would, on your way out, uh, we'd love to have you stack the chairs just to help us out. It's been helping the last few weeks so much. Uh, just stack them nine high. Is that right? Eight high? Eight high. Less than eight or less. They just do that. <laughs> Thanks so much. Y'all have a great week.